Hi, my name is Richard Delaney from Rope Lab in Australia. I'm going to talk today about ropes. It's something that underpins everything we do as a roping technician, whether we're running through devices or using it to haul loads or other things. Um, there's a few different topics and I want to start by talking about the construction, the way they're put together. I've got many different rope samples on the table here in front of me and unless you're aware of the model and the brand or the manufacturer, you don't really know what it was designed for or even the way it was put together. But generally they're all of kern mantle construction which means there are two parts that make up that rope. There's the mantle or the sheath and there's the kern or the core which is generally um, for, for this rope in particular it's the same kind of material they're both nylon but for, for others they're often different materials as well. Now just when we look at the construction and I'll just move these ones away a little bit. So this Edelrid semi-static rope has a nylon sheath and a nylon core which is made up of many twisted bundles of individual fibers. Now if I just get this other rope here this is also an Edelrid rope but this is a dynamic rope which has still got a, a nylon sheath and a nylon core but if I just expose the core here you'll see that each of these bundles rather than just being a bundle of roughly parallel fibers or with a slight twist to them you should be able to see that these ones there's actually a lot more twist to them I've got to untwist it that far to get these to separate so these bundles of twisted fibers what does that mean well these two ropes are made of the same material they're both 100% polyamide or nylon but because of the twist in this it means that when I put it under load it's going to try and untwist those and we get more elongation or stretch for this dynamic rope which is why rock climbers will use this rope rather than this one. It'll be a softer catch when they're having that fall which is a part of climbing every, every day on the planet. Now while I've got these two ropes out you'll notice with this semi-static one and a lot of people make this assumption as well the semi-static rope here has this tracer line inside it that will have a couple of bits of different information there depending on which standard it complies to but that will tell us, um, for example, it's an EN 1891 type A semi-static rope for, for life support. This dynamic rope here, this Edward rope, does not have a tracer strand inside it, or not one with text. Instead, it has a colored strand, this black fiber here. And each manufacturer will use different colors, and that'll give us an idea of the year of manufacture for that rope. Also, interestingly, for dynamic climbing ropes, it's unusual to find a stated strength or minimum breaking strength for those for those ropes whereas it's really common for any of the semi-static ropes or low elongation ropes or even accessory cords they'll have a strength stated with them. Those requirements for the information that will generally vary according to the standard to which they're manufactured. So Kern mantle ropes I've shown you those two basic kinds there. I'm now going to show you one which is quite different um, this is an arborist access rope from the outside. It's an 11.2 millimeter rope, which is unusually thin for arborist lines. Normally they'd be a little bit thicker. Um, but this one actually, it's, it's got that braided kern, uh, the braided mantle, the braided sheath. But then inside, it's another braid. Um, and it's actually a hollow braid. There's nothing, nothing inside there, which means that we can splice terminations readily on this. There are a couple of other differences with the materials they've used in that rope that I'll talk about in a minute as well. Another example of that is this, um, this rope here which has the braided sheath over a braided core but then rather than being a, a hollow braid it's got some extra fibers inside which fill that out just so that that rope when you compress it and knot it it maintains its roundness. Particularly important if you're running it through devices that are expecting to have a round rope run through them. So there's a few differences on the construction there. Um, other differences you might notice in, in your experience with ropes will be the, how tight the sheath of the rope feels. So how, how stiff it is in hand. So this rope has a particularly tight weave to the sheath. A lot of canyoners and cavers prefer a, a really tight weave to the sheath. Whereas rock climbers want a nice soft and supple rope. So there's a few things on the construction. Um, let's go straight into the materials now. I mentioned this rope here. It has a 100% polyamide sheath and core. 
polyamide and polyester such as this rope here um, so we've got the Edelwood semi-static rope this is a sterling high tenacity polyester rope or HTP you might have heard it referred to that has a polyester sheath and a polyester core they look the same I mean subtle differences obviously in colors here but unless you know that that's a polyester rope and that's a nylon rope there's no way of knowing just by looking at them they'll perform the same if you're trying to cut them they'll look the same if you open them up um, so you are just going to be dependent on knowing where that rope came from and what it was manufactured from so polyamide or nylon um, polyester and polyester there are a couple of hybrid ropes coming out now too such as this Edelwood rope here which is a polyester sheath over a nylon core um, now the, some of the different properties that we might expect with those and many of you will have heard me say this before I really don't understand why we for for rescue and rope access work I mean there's a couple of reasons but generally a lower elongation rope is what I'm after and this rope here the HTP rope has a much lower elongation than this than this than this Edward semi-static rope now it's a bit unfair to make that distinction because in fact it's a requirement of Ian 1891 uh, for type A ropes that they have a minimum elongation when you do a drop test and it limits the peak force to that 100, kilo, that 100 kilogram falling mass to less than 6 kilonewtons the NFP 1983 rope standard doesn't have that same requirement so they can get away with having a, a rope that's certified for use in, in, in countries that recognize that standard or the Cordage Institute standard specifically um, that we can use these ropes for me I like it when I've got a rope set in place um, and then I walk towards the edge and I load that rope up I don't have that sagging feeling as the first person on the rope to feel all that stretch so that's why I prefer this same when, when we're doing the rescue work and we're doing our raising and lowering if I want the load to come up uh, 30 centimeters I know I've only got to take 30 centimeters up at the top and it'll come up 30 centimeters and it will be a nice smooth with no bounce going on um, with, with that transition um, this hybrid rope here and there are quite a few that have the polyester sheath because the polyester ropes seem to be slightly harder wearing and give better abrasion resistance than the nylon ones um, this is right on the limit so they've still got the, the, the nylon core with the polyester sheath it's right on the limit of that 6 kilonewton allowable peak force during the drop test if I come to this rope here now the one that I mentioned is the double braid rope before this Yale blue tongue um, the core of this is very different and there's a couple of giveaways to it one is it has that sort of brown color and I'll talk a bit more about that with these other ropes so it actually has an aramid fiber and in fact if I fluff that up a little bit more you'll see it's brown and white so it's a 50 50 mix of aramid and dyneema in that braid which doesn't have the twists like this dynamic rope it's that, that braid with relatively parallel strands all the way through that's the lowest elongation kern mantle rope of all of the ropes that I've looked at the elongation for um, it's also super strong uh, let's have a look at this one here this um, this is the sterling rope canyon lux it's an eight millimeter uh, canyoning rope that, that we use for a couple of different things I mentioned that brownness in in this core material here we'll see that in the sheath here so it's not always uh, a guarantee that those brown fibers will be aramid um, technora or twaron or some of those fa fabrics but it, it's it's a pretty good indication the reason that they've got the technora sheath on this rope is that technora or aramid fibers uh, demonstrate consistently that they are better for for managing abrasion and particularly heat that's the main advantage with them um, the, you can't dye technora as readily as other fibers so the green and the blue flex in this they're strands of polyester so that's why on their their instructions or their specifications I'll say it's got a an aramid or technora slash polyester sheath the polyester is it's a cheaper fiber but it's also to add a bit of color for distinction and to see movement of the rope um, and then the core they'll say it's a dyneema um, and um, polypropylene uh, mix it's hundred percent dyneema in this braided section here which gives us all its strength but these polypropylene strands here that's purely as I said just to give it the roundness and polypropylene is one of the cheaper uh, fibers that we can use for rope construction it doesn't serve any functional purpose not strength not elongation or anything all it is is to maintain that roundness of the rope 
I have heard some people say, oh, it's got polypropylene in, that means it'll float. That's absolutely not the case because Technora is one of the heaviest fibers. The specific gravity is, is 1.12 or something. It's much, much heavier than, than water and the other fibers. The polypropylene has a lower specific gravity. It's less than one, which means polypropylene on its own will float. Um, but the, the Technora certainly doesn't. For this rope to float, it would almost need airbags built into it. Um, just, just while I'm mentioning it, here's another, another example of a rope. This one, this one is polypropylene. And why is it polypropylene? Well, this is a throw rope for swift water rescue. We want that to float. We don't want submerged ropes that have the potential to, to snag around people and get tangled up. So polypropylene has uh, some definite advantages, particularly for water rescue where it, where it floats. But we sacrifice strength and we sacrifice heat tolerance. I'll talk a bit more mater about materials and diameter, which, which, are, which are construction related. I've got three different ropes. I've actually got four different ropes hanging up here. They're all 60 meters in length. This is an 11 millimeter rope. This is a 9.5 millimeter rope, and this is an eight millimeter rope. This last one here, some people will call it a rope. It's got a very specific use, but I don't generally think about things that are six millimeters in diameter as ropes. But let's go back to these three here. Um, this 11 millimeter uh, rope, it has a Technora sheath. You can tell again, in fact, all of these do, that, that, that tan color is the giveaway for that, which makes them good for their heat resistance and abrasion resistance. Um, this one has a Technora sheath and a polyester core. Um, it's almost the same as that other yellow HTP rope I was showing you here which has the 100% polyester construction, but they put a Technora sheath on that to give us better abrasion and heat tolerance. This 9.5 millimeter rope um, has a Technora sheath and it has a nylon core. By putting a nylon core in there um, and working on the construction, this one actually manages to meet in 1891 as a type B rope. The thing I love about this 9.5 millimeter rope is it's actually directly compatible with many of the standard devices which are on the market as descenders and belay devices. Um, and this last one here is the eight millimeter rope. This is the Op Lux version of the Canyon Lux, uh, the eight millimeter um, rope that, that I had on the table there. Technora sheath with a bit of polyester, dynamic core with the polypropylene strands to keep it round. So why would I choose between these three ropes? Well, just, just a few statistics on these. This, as I said, they're all 60 meters. This 11 millimeter rope, um, that weighs six kilograms. The nine and a half millimeter rope weighs four kilograms and the eight millimeter rope weighs three kilograms. So for the same length rope, that's half the weight as, as this one here. If I'm a back country, as in really back country, pack everything in uh, five plus kilometers to do a job, then there's significant reasons why I'd consider taking that over that. And the other big difference is, if I look at the packed volume, how much room is that going to take up in my pack? That takes up 12 litres of space. This one's eight and a half litres, and this one only takes up six litres. So six litres to 12 litres, um, three kilograms to six kilograms. So we've halved the weight and halved the volume. How do we go for strength? This is a 36 kilonewton rope. This is a 24 kilonewton rope. 24 kilonewtons is still plenty. It hasn't got the same overhead as this one, and we'll come to abrasion resistance in a minute as well. Um, but 24 kilonewtons means that even if I put a knot in that, and I use my standard derating of 50% for any time I put a knot in ropes, half of 24 is still 12 kilonewtons. If we look at the acceptable arrest force on a falling body, it's six kilonewtons. So this can withstand twice the acceptable uh, arrest force on a human body, 12 kilonewtons. <clears throat> with a knot in it. Um, the problem with the eight kilo, uh, with the eight millimeter rope is there's not a lot of devices that we can put that straight into. Um, I know that a couple of them work. However, because this there's no standard other than as a, an NFPA 1983 escape rope or an accessory cord, there's no rope standard that this is tested to with any of the standard belay devices or descenders that we might want to use. So that makes it challenging to use, which is why I often end up going with the nine and a half millimeter rope with different organizations I work with. That's six kilograms, that's four kilograms. So I've saved two kilograms. 
The packed volume of that is 12 litres, this is more like 8 litres. Um, the strength of that is 36 kilonewtons, this is 30 kilonewtons. Okay, so 36, 30, 24 kilonewtons. So it's a really good in-between rope. It saves us a significant amount over this one um, and gives us that administrative ease of, of being a lot more flexible with the devices that we can put that through. <coughs> So there's a few different, different aspects of diameter that we need to think about there and the dif different standards that they might be certified to. Um, one thing, you might have noticed that the mess of these ropes that I've got here on the bench in front of me, um, the thing that I have just finished doing is a whole series of abrasion tests uh, looking at the tolerance of different ropes to different abrasive events. Um, and it was nothing about trying to rank the ropes in terms of which is better and which is worse. What I was more trying to look at is, as there's a trend um, in, in many activities, whether it's rope access or rescue or rock climbing or canyoneering, um, the consideration about whether, whether to have two strands of rope bearing the weight or only a single strand. So for example, if I have this as my pair of ropes that I'm descending on in a canyon, and I was to have a, a lateral swing running across an edge, what's the tolerance of that to that abrasive events with, with all of my mass on it, as opposed to just the single strand? Now logically, if I double the strands, it should be at least twice the resistance. But the other, the other change, significant change with that, is I haven't just doubled the strands, but I've halved the tension on each of the strands. And if you do that thought experiment, if I have a rope and I'm holding it really tight, it should be very easy to cut. But if I'm holding the rope loose like this and then I come up with my abrasive event, it's going to be much harder to cut that and it's not a linear relationship. So from those tests across all of these different ropes, the difference between having one strand loaded and two strands loaded is between four and eight times the tolerance to an abrasive event. Uh, so that's why I've got all of these cut. The bottom line still is like we, we must avoid those events because we can completely sever ropes and people I mean, the Edelred studies looking at the history over, over an extended period shows that we typically have two catastrophic events every year on average for, I think, the last 30 years, um, which has resulted in a severe accident from a rope that's severed during an abrasive event. So that, that abrasion and the protection of ropes is something that we need to, need to think about really carefully. Um, having said that, now if I go back to these ropes on the wall here, this 8 millimeter rope, compared to this 11 millimeter rope, this I would say has more than twice the abrasion resistance of this one here. It's not directly proportional to, to the diameter of the rope. Um, it comes into the materials and the way that the core strands are constructed or put together. So for example, coming back to the desk, if I look at this rope here, which has um, this, this quite shallow pitch to the, the braid within the core and compare that to to this rope here, for example, which doesn't have a braided core, it has parallel strands. For that one particular kind of abrasive event where I introduce a lateral movement, these ones are perpendicular to that event, so it's more likely to snag the strands and cut them. Whereas these, these strands here, because they're already at that pitch, that mechanism coming across is not going to snag and cut the strands quite as easily. So, that was, a, that was another good takeout from, from Edelred's um, tests, is just by looking at a rope, you can't predict how well it's going to cope with an abrasive event. The key outcome from their abrasion tests were the most important thing we can do is reduce the tension on the strand of rope. So rather than descending with a two-person load, it's much better for the system if we only descend with a single-person load. In a rescue context, wherever we can lower a single person or raise a single person, it's better than two people. Um, from my tests, I've, I've confirmed that stuff, but also shown that we're much better off if we can put that load and share it between two strands, regardless of whether it's a single person or a two person load. Um, one thing that I do want to talk about is like I, I see a lot of people with more and more Technora fiber ropes in the field struggling to, to cut those and finish the ends neatly. So I'm just going to show a, a quick little trick about the way I terminate those ropes. I'll just move these ones to the side. Um, and here I've got this short section of the Canyon Lux rope and you can see I've, I've well that's from the abrasion tests I was doing so that's just rough torn. Um, 
If I try and cut that with a hot knife, as I would for any of the other ropes that I'd normally use, all it's going to do is char the fibers. It doesn't melt them because you can't melt technora. It doesn't melt and flow like the nylons and the polyesters. Um, it just chars and you get like a, a, a carbony sort of finish to it. Um, and, and you end up bending the hot knife. So look, what I'd recommend is to get some PVC electrical tape, we often call that, wrap it around really tightly around the sheath and then get the sharpest knife you can find, not scissors, but a knife and cut that cleanly against a hard surface or that one that's not going to damage your knife. Once that's cut, so now I've got the two cut ends. If I took that tape off, we'll see that, that um, it, it's, it's now just rough. It, it's cut, but quite neatly, but I can still fray that up. Once it's cut, what I should then do is get some, what we call super glue. And I'll just squirt or drop a small amount of that into the end of the rope and then let that set. So now that's quite hard. Um, and once it's set, I'll then peel the tape off. So we get it looking like this. And then the final step is I'll get the glue and I'll run some around the sides. So then I end up with what looks like a rope, like the other nylon ropes that I'd cut with the hot knife and then run the hot knife on the side. I've got that effectively the same thing. So I've got the sheath bonded to the core. I've got no loose fibers um, and the core is sealed as well. So that way it's not gonna fall apart. That's the, I find that's the, the tidiest way to cut these Technora, um, these Technora sheathed ropes. Uh, the final thing I'll talk about, I mean, we spoke about abrasive events uh, a minute ago, um, but the importance of protecting ropes running over edges, I can't understate that enough. Of course, the primary way to manage that is to have people with good skills and make sure that they're, they're good at uh, abseiling or repelling in places and used to choosing the best possible line for that rope over an edge. But we can't, you know, th there are places where we can certainly protect that rope. Now, many people have made different things or used different things for rope protection. Maybe it's just the rope bag that you've got lying around. Um, it might make you feel good and stop the rope glancing on an edge and getting a little bit fluffy and a little bit worn. However, if there was a, a dynamic event, a sudden fall, this is practically invisible to that event. It will provide no extra protection to the rope. And it's great to see now that there are a, quite a good range of different rope protectors coming out on the market. This one is relatively new to the market um, and they've done a great job with this. And it, it's so thick that even if I have the rope moving through it, it's not going to melt through this, 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 um, this, this rope protector. Um, the other thing I really like about this is that it sandwiches on the rope, but in the top and bottom here, there's a, like a, a bit of a, it's not sticky, but it's, it provides quite a bit of, not adhesion, it doesn't stick to it, but it grips the rope so that when I sandwich that over the rope, if I haven't got anything to tie it to, it does actually hold itself in position very well on that suspended rope and won't fall down the rope as I move past it. Um, another shameless plug, um, DMM, um, I went to in 2016, I think it was, with this idea of uh, an edge roller that has individual skateboard wheel ball bearings um, mounted across a range of axles. That, that enables me to have multiple ropes installed in a system running an over, an, over an edge and I can have one rope moving and one rope not moving but I still get all the benefits of, of, uh, of a zero friction interface at an edge. Um, if I don't manage that friction, if I'm using a more traditional rope edge protector and I'm hauling, if that's a 90 degree edge over concrete, then if that's if that's a 100 kilogram load down there, by the time I've got all that friction, it feels like 200 kilograms back at the anchor. This means 100 kilograms pretty much still works as 100 kilograms, maybe 120 kilograms. It's quite an efficient edge roller. Uh, so look, there's, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of things I could talk about with ropes. The next obvious thing is knots, but I'm gonna do a separate video on that. Uh, but anyway, look, thanks for the feedback on the last one where I talked about carabiners. I might try and keep going with this series, uh, informational series on the equipment we use as technicians. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thanks.